I usually give this talk to uh, a group of religious leaders. So <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't look like a bear other than rich or very unusual, right? But you know, you know, work with me on this. And so I say the first thing you should do is you ask a rabbi. And the great thing about asking a rabbi, I have religious questions. If you don't like the answer, you just ask a different rabbi. On tax law, on tax law not so much. And, um, uh, you probably all, if you've been uh, with your foundation for a while, you understand that you probably deal with lawyers who basically say, well, the safest thing is for you to do nothing. And that's, and that's true. There is safety in doing nothing. But as the sage Hillel said, if, if I am not for myself, you know, who is for me? But if I am for myself, alone, what good am I in? What now when? So you're here probably because you like to do something, uh, and you want to accomplish things for your position, and there are things uh, in the nonprofit sector that are encouraged, not even just permitted, but they're encouraged. The other lesson I want to give you is back behind the camera, there's a uh, uh, hat and duck in the pants who have um, this ability And for those of you who aren't from Phoenix and didn't grow up with Walls and Lambo, Pat's an incredibly large personality that's on Walls and Lambo, uh, radio and professional. One day, as he tells a story, he came home and they have their house off the side of the PSP. And his mother, who was in her 80s, was mooning over the balcony. And he said, Mom, what are you doing? And, and she said, well, it just seems so much more efficient than going door to door. <laughs> so <laughs> what I want you to get from this is, you know, philanthropic leaders can make a difference, but you're probably dealing with a lot of people who are in the business of giving a man a fish. Public policy is how you teach people to fish. It's how you basically change so that there are now programs that put fish in there that the person you taught to fish can, can do it. Now, you know, maybe you come from big sources of um, piles of money and you can do lots of things on your own, but on the other hand, the way you really accomplish things in this country is through, is through public activity and public policy. that's so much more efficient than going than moody people who are doing. So, you all probably know the logo. 501 is a section of the Internal Revenue Code, 501C, or the organizations that are exempt from tax. The key is 501c3. Those are organizations that, that have kind of a double benefit. Um, they are not only exempt from tax themselves, but also contributions to them are tax deductible. So those are tax favored money, and it's easier to raise money for 501c3 than it is for other types of tax exempt organizations. They're very specific types. Most of you are probably 501c3s. You're charitable, religious, educational, those are those are the characters you good. Most of you are community benefit organizations. You have to be organized and operated exclusively for, for, for charitable purposes, and your assets have to be permanently restricted. That's that thing in your articles that says on dissolution it has to go to another C3. That's that permanent restriction. Um, and one thing you have to remember is there's no propaganda, there's no election activity for or against candidates, but not everything that's electoral involves a candidate. There are two types of things you want to say. The presumption is you are a private foundation, a PF. There's lots of logos here, EOs, PFs, and PCs. And this is one area where PC is good. So <laughs> EOs are <coughs> organizations. You're assumed to be a private foundation, which some of you probably are, uh, uh, unless you qualify as a public charity. Public charity status is better. You have a lot more leeway, greater flexibility for donors, you can do all these sorts of things. Now, this is an interesting thing because the IRS basically assumes, the tax law assumes that as if there's a market for charitable donations. That if you have to go out into the market and get donations from the public, you have incentives to be governed better, you have incentives to do better things. If you're just a pile, private pile of money, somebody makes a ton of your business and creates a private foundation, and there's no public input, and you don't have to go anywhere and ask anybody for it. The assumption is you may have, you, you don't have any incentive to be governed better or to be. So the idea is that if you're dependent on public support, either from public generally or from government, probably that requires you to do a better job. Does it or not? It's, it's really an open question, but that's, that's the theory behind it. And if you're a private foundation, the idea is that we don't really want you to uh, not to engage in insider dealing and do things that you should be sponsored. So we're going to make you basically give your money to public charities. 
what are the benefits of public charity? I mean, basically, this, uh, a lot of this is just of interest to your finance people, uh, but the large thing is you can engage in limited lobbying. You may have been told that you were C3, you can't do electoral activities, you can't do it for candidates, but you can lobby as long as it's no substantial part of what you do. If you're a private foundation, you're not allowed to lobby. Uh, the IRS for private foundations has an excise tax system. Uh, so basically, if you make a, for a uh, prohibited expenditure in any of these activities, there's a kind of a two-step process. They whack you with like a 20 or 25 percent excise tax on the amount of the expenditure, and then you have to reverse it within a period of time. And if you don't reverse it, then basically it's like a hundred or a 200 percent. Uh, and some of these are so serious that foundation managers can be subject to excise taxes as well. So it is true, private foundations can't do anything about influencing legislation. Lobbying is an excise, it, it gets excise tax. If you don't undo it or find other resources or undo the finances, it's there. If you give other than to public charities, uh, you could run, run into trouble as well. If you do anything other than 501c3 purposes. So you're on a much narrower tightrope than are, is a public charity. For those of you who are public charities, congratulations. You have been told that you have to watch what you're doing. The answer is, yeah, about as well as you drive. But if you're a private foundation, you have to do a lot more. You're much more of a type of walker than you think you can. And so and that's our first lesson for today. Public foundation, uh, private foundations, you really do have to be careful, but there are things you can do, we'll get to that. If you're a public charity, you have a lot more leeway than probably. Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, other uh, exempt organization types. You may wonder, how does a tax exempt organization do all these political things? Uh, and that's because it's a 501c4, usually. This is the preferred vehicle, what are called social welfare uh, organizations. These organizations are tax exempt, they don't pay any taxes on what they make, but there's no deduction for giving to any of these organizations. Uh, and they basically, you know, they're supposed to do, the majority of what they do is supposed to be social welfare, public education, but there are, right, this is the loud mess now. There are essentially very no limit, there are no limits. The IRS isn't in a position really to um, go audit anybody. So these are, these are types of Citizens United vehicles. These are ways, the, uh, these are ways to create the dark money uh, in the electoral process. Uh, and uh, uh, there's very little, current disclosure, um, which is why there's dark, it may be disclosed after the fact. Uh, and that, that last bullet is, is for uh, uh, the churches, basically, that they can do it if you can move it you know, hundreds or thousands of times larger than what you can do it. So these are not, this is this is not, I just want you to know, people wonder out there how, how on earth are taxes and organizations doing all these political things. It's because to their donors, Deductibility isn't really an issue. Uh, apparently, after you get to a certain amount of money, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> lobbying by public charities. As I said before, lobbying is permitted, but it be, must be no substantial part. That's a key phrase. Uh, so that's the second thing I want you to just you know, get that tattoo on your arm. No substantial part. There are two ways to define what no substantial part is. The first is qualitative. You know, where does the tail end and the dog begin? Um, there are cases that say 5% is okay. There are cases that say go over 10%, uh, that's too much. Um, but these are all trial court decisions. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule. There's no safe harbor here. But generally, uh, people, if you're at 5% or less, your lawyers don't start sweating until you get between 5 and 10, and at 10, they start vibrating like a tuning fork. But there is a safe harbor. There's an exact red line if you want to do it. There's an election a public charity can make under what's section 501H, which is further down in the tax code the same. And it provides clear dollar limits. You can elect this uh, when you organize the public charity. You can elect it any time for a tax year. And you'll also can drop out of it. Uh, but you just file this form for the IRS, uh, and it says we're going to do this numerically. We're going to track our lobbying expenditures. We're going to make sure that we're within the safe harbor. The safe harbor is pretty good in that uh, you can spend, if you're a small charity, up to 20% of your first half million, 15% of the next, and 10% of the next, and 5% of the remaining, um, which means that 
that's that's like a lot of room for a small public charity to do lobbying activities. Um, there's a sublimit in that, so you can go up to one million dollars, which if you're a twenty million dollar nonprofit public charity, which is you know fairly good size, you can spend up to five percent, um, which was kind of where you are in the qualitative test. There's a what's called a grassroots lobbying sublimit. This is really a big issue, which is how much you can spend going to your members and saying, you guys need to contact the legislatures. It's like 25% of that million cap can be spent on that. And I guess the idea is that if you have more than three members, you're you know, inundating the legislature with all your members. But um, that's, that's pretty technical at this point. But that gives you a lot of leeway for, for a nonprofit to spend and to know that you're absolutely dead cold certain that you haven't exceeded it track this accurately and you stay within those percentages, you're good. You're good. That's permitted. Um, here are some examples. If you have the $2 million budget, you can you could spend 25% of it on lobbying if if you're a public charity and you make this uh, make this election, there'd be that 25% cap on grassroots lobbying. If you're a big CEO, you know, if you're over a hundred million, you probably don't have to make this election. You could probably spend two percent of what you do in one money, which would be two million dollars. Don't limit yourself to a million. Um, if you're kind of right at the break point, around seventeen to twenty million dollars, depends, you know, what your board says, how how much they like living with the qualitative rules, as opposed to just keeping track of numbers. Now, you know, uh, I'm a lawyer. I think I think you're supposed to get up in the morning and write down how long it took you to shower. And <laughs> sector and think that that's not really a good way to live, but that's what you have to do to make a proper 501H election. You've got to track who does what, how much of their salary can be allocated to that, how much of what you really have to do a good job of it to make sure that you're accounting for it. But if you are, it gives you a lot of room uh, as a public charity to run. However, for both public PCs and PFs, political campaign activity, meaning Supporting or opposing a candidate is absolutely true. You can't spend one dime on that sort of thing. You can't favor a candidate, you can't oppose a candidate, and the IRS says you can't do things that have the effect of favoring or opposing a candidate. Now, how do how do uh, religious figures get up in the pulpit to talk about uh, the importance of uh, their faith issues? And leader in this country has to oppose this or support that, and there's only two candidates, and you know, one of them is on one side and the other is on the other side. How do they do that? Well, there's a, a the, the liberal, uh, my liberal brethren, religious group are pissed off about that, but you know, how do you do it? Well, one way, a lot of religious leaders just basically say, I'm doing this as an individual. You know, I'm not using resources, there's no dollars changing hands here, we're not spending uh, the second is, a lot of them just don't care, you know, they're telling the IRS to come after me. That may not be how you want to live, that's not how I'm defining it. And, and the, the third is that they, uh, uh, well, that, that's about it. They either don't care or they're not spending church funds or, uh, you know, want to say, come, come get the cover and know that, uh, that they're on the right side of the, uh, uh, they're, on, they're on the right side of the argument that if the IRS does try to do it, uh, whoever does it will be called up for the pressure to pay. So um, you don't give up your First Amendment rights just because you work for a nonprofit. You can say things individually. That's one, one issue. And the second is, is the IRS is going out on a limb here about having the effect because then what does that mean? You know, how close to the line can you go? Uh, and there are First Amendment issues here. So that's the third reason, which is a lot of times they're saying, I'm just lecturing you on moral belief and how to act in the world. Uh, I am not instructing you how to vote. There may be only one, one way to interpret what I'm saying, but what I am saying is religious doctrine. It's my interpretation of religious doctrine you should worry about. So keep in mind that we're talking about kind of bright lines here, but uh, uh, there are uh, many, many people in this country who are spending their living pushing against those red lines, and they tend to move. So, can't support or oppose a candidate, though. That's that's pretty much a clear line for any any 
501c3 and PF or PC. It includes nonpartisan elections. So judicial elections, school boards, if it's a candidate, you got, you got an issue. However, initiatives and referenda are not candidates. So if you're a public charity, you can give money to an initiative campaign. You know, somebody gets signatures to put something good on the ballot, you want to support it, you can give money to that. That's lobbying, as long as it's not a substantial part of what you're doing. So we think of that, elections is one big kind of category where it's on the same ballot. But the IRS says that ballot, you know, the first part of the ballot where people's names are, you can't play. But the back, where those things have the three-digit numbers and you vote yes or no, that's lobbying because it's all about legislation, so that's permitted. So what is lobbying in the IRS? What can public charities do? It's attempting to influence legislation, includes contacting staff as well as officials, but we've already talked about grassroots lobbying, that's going to your members and saying, you contact those people. Um, and initiative for referendum campaign, um, here's the fourth thing I want you to remember. No candidate, no problem. <laughs> But what isn't lobbying? Now here's where the private foundation people are. I want you to pay attention here. First, nonpartisan analysis, study, or research. Even if what you're doing is going to be taken by somebody who is going to do lobbying, as long as it's nonpartisan, as long as it's good research, um, and you know, I used to get these things in politics where the Heritage Foundation at the bottom and said this is not intended to you know, be support or oppose any specific piece of legislation, just as neutral research. Yeah, right, right. But, you know, <laughs> it was, and it was permitted. So, so polling falls in here. Polling could, yes. Polling for a candidate, I wouldn't do it. Polling on issues or seeing where the public is or the public awareness of particular things, as long as there's a full and fair discussion, there's no direct call to action, there's no broad dissemination. You're not, you're not then taking that poll and beating legislators over the head of it. If it is part of basically a report, the, the, the Arizona we want, the one that totally missed immigration as an issue. Anyway, um, <laughs> so um, that sort of thing would be permitted uh, and isn't lobbying. If you get a written request from a, uh, uh, a written request from a legislator or a staff member saying, we know you have expertise in this area. What can you, can you help us with this point? That doesn't count against your lobbying expenditure. Sorry, go ahead. I was just wondering the, about the term broad dissemination, because it seems like for full and fair discussion, you would want broad dissemination. No, full and fair discussion of the issue in the analysis or research. Oh, okay. You can't basically sort of do a research paper that just sort of says, tails, I win. Okay. <laughs> you sure. have to, okay, so a full discussion of issue in the paper, okay. but then the paper can't be broadly disseminated to the people of the Does that help? That's where you are. There's a difference between how far the paper goes and yeah. what's inside the paper. All right. Organizational self-defense. This applies to, to PFs as well. If your organization is challenged, that doesn't count as lobbying. You know, so that if you're talking about your ability to stand up there or somebody challenges or you're responding to what somebody says about you, that's not lobbying. Communication to bona fide members if there's no call to action. So if you just tell them about an issue, but you don't tell them what to do about it, do you trust your members? That I don't think you should. Um, certain types of administrative bodies, if they're if they have limited jurisdiction. So um, my friends from Sierra Vista, uh, hospital districts, limited jurisdiction. Uh, public, uh, it would probably not be lobbying to assist the hospital district in a tax to support, to support the hospital here out, out in Little County. And then finally, if there's no money involved, if, you, if you're just speaking from the pulpit and there's no cash expenditure, it doesn't count against your 501. So that's what's not. Um, specific legislation. This is the IRS view. Keep in mind that uh, this is not the definition of lobbying that the IRS uses is not the definition of lobbying that other people use primarily the state of Arizona and the federal government. So specific legislation doesn't involve litigation, doesn't involve executive orders, doesn't involve enforcement of existing laws. If you're a public charity and you say there is this law on the books that would call 
for equitable funding of public schools to pick something out of the air, that might not be lobbying, depending on how you did it, because you'd be urging enforcement of an existing law. And regulations, you're allowed to talk about regulations. The, the IRS just views lobbying as dealing with specific legislation for elected bodies of general jurisdiction. But specific legislation does include treaties, legislative confirmations, uh, constitutional amendments, and bond measures. So. Specific example, the access waiver request with act, the access administration for Medicaid program seeks public comment on its waiver request to the federal government and there are changes. That's not lobbying because it's not legislation, correct? That's kind of on the edge, but it, because it's a, uh, it's a policy decision by the executive branch, but that, as long as it doesn't require legislation, I think I think you would have good basis for saying I am I am providing input uh, either as uh, nonpartisan full and fair discussion or in response. You know, it's not in response to a request. The request has to be direct. So I mean, one thing you could do is get a friendly legislator to ask you for a specific response. To the issue. But as long as it doesn't have to have anything going through the legislature there's this opportunity, that's more akin to regulations and wouldn't count for the IRS definition of lobbying. Would count for state state law, but it wouldn't count for Only if there was state legislation that's in place somehow. Well, no, I mean, the state definition of lobbying, uh, I can slide later, is okay. if you get, you know, if you're urging them to do something, that counts as lobbying. So, even if it's executive staff and legislative staff, that counts as lobbying. For state law, if it's this substantive area, it wouldn't count for, for IRS purposes. Difficult situations for public charities. Uh, this is just, these are the teasers for the movies. I'm not going to go into all these, but we've already talked about the guy in the pulpit. Am I doing individual activity? Am I speaking for the organization or not? These are gray areas you have to worry about. Uh, inviting office holders who may be candidates to speak. What about websites? What about sharing of uh, email lists? All of these are issues where you can get into trouble and you should think through what you're doing and recognizing that um, you're doing any of these things, voter education, get out the vote. There are real strict rules um, for that for public charities and incredibly strict schools for, for, for private foundations. But um, this is where you get into uh, difficulty where you should probably seek legal advice. But what you'll notice for all of these is basically all of these involve candidate elections. If you just remember the general rule that candidates know issues, yes, you should be okay for those things. Uh, lobbying regulation. If you do lobbying, however, it, the IRS may have no issue. You may have your 501H election, or you just may be no substantial part. But if you actually do start lobbying, both federal and state laws may require you to register. Uh, the federal law, the Lobbyist Disclosure Act, the Honest uh, and Open Government, I forget what the L stands for, it's the Honest and Something Open Government Act. If you have somebody who spends more than 20% of her or his time and makes more than one contact and you spend more than, it's probably, it's adjusted for inflation, maybe it's high as 13,000 now, then you have to register as a lobbyist. Now it's federal. Federal, you know, in Washington, they don't care what you're doing in the state law, but that's that's where you have to register in DC. The state law basically is an incredibly broad definition of law, much broader than the IRS, and, and it includes your volunteers going, uh, and it also includes nonpartisan research. If you're doing something that has the intent of affecting legislation, even if it's one of the categories the IRS doesn't care about, then you may have to register if you make any expenditure or do peer other than on behalf of yourself as an individual. <coughs> you speak for your organization, you probably have to register with the Secretary of State. If you go down there as an individual, and you may say what your employer is or whatever, but if you clear your speaking as an individual, you can speak as an individual. That's a first amendment. Speaking as an organization, you may have to register. At that point, you have to start tracking expenditures and so on. And you may find it just more <coughs> cost effective for you to go hire a lot. Lobbying both is and is not for amateurs. Um, you, know, you may want to have a professional, but on the other hand, they sort of they pack amateurs on the head a lot of times, unless they disagree. Okay, they don't let you speak.
Well, your private foundation, when you're doing nonpartisan research, a state line, you might be welcome. Um, theoretically, you could. If, it, if your research qualifies for the IRS, you're allowed to do it. But on the other hand, uh, it is then intended or used. Um, at that point, I would suggest that you partner with somebody else. We'll get to that. Is that my next slide? What kind of private foundation do? How does that work? Oh, you're such a good transition. Um, for that sort of thing, I think you should partner with people for whom the, the lobby isn't an issue. You know, where you, you're the research owner. Do the things you can as a private foundation. So, uh, as a private foundation, it's a lot better, I think, uh, if, if, for example, there's a legislator on the inside who wants to have access to research or to something from the, from the, the, the charitable community, if that request can be directed to a private foundation, that's probably, that frees up public charities to do the lobbying that they could do the private foundation. Litigation. Private foundation should seriously consider litigation as a, as a change um, uh, That involves risks, and, and as um, Learned Hand once said, uh, other than as a lawyer, I mean, the, the only thing uh, I should not want, the only things less attractive than being an actual litigant in a lawsuit, I think, are illness and death. So, uh, but on the other hand, you know, you, you get to do it as part of your day job. Um, you convening public sessions, educating legislators and public officials, enforcement of existing laws. Private foundations also can build relationships with elected officials as long as you don't step over the line with actual support or opposition or encouragement of specific legislation. Becoming a resource for those folks is something you can do as a, as a private foundation. You can also partner with public charities or with government. So jointly funded projects with government units, the IRS likes this. Because, I mean, remember the idea about the market? Uh, here, government takes the place of the market. They're publicly accountable. And so they don't worry about the public charities giving things to them because the voters have their say in the government. You know, grants to public charities. You just can't fund uh, uh, lobbying by the PC. But there are other ways to do that. So you can't earmark it. And you also can't give for a specific project if you're a, a, a PF where there's a line item for lobbying. You can only fund the non-lobbying portions of that. But you can also give unrestricted grants to public charities that are doing good work. And as long as the public charity decides what it's going to do and it complies with the law, you're okay. Um, and then finally, if you give them a hundred grand in their spend. Maybe our program and the rest on lobbying can trace that back and say what well, you effectively fund the lobbying. Not if you gave them if you gave them unrestricted general support for that hundred grand, you are not responsible for their decisions as to what they do with that unrestricted general support. If you've given it to them, no strings on that, and they get to decide what to do it, then the lobbying doesn't check back to you. If you're exercising control over what or in response to a budget, you have to exclude the lobby. But even if you do exclude the lobby part, they can go raise money from other than private foundations to support their public activities. I mean, funding 80% of a project is better than funding that. So give unrestricted general support with no strings, or fund the non-lobby portions of it and let them go out and fundraise the rest. Uh, don't require them to fundraise and do the lobbying, but it's just leave it, leave it to be their decision. And finally, the last point, underappreciated. Your donors can act on their own. It cost Art Pope like $4 million to essentially take over the state of North Carolina. I mean, it's not a whole heck of a lot of money. And, and the guys in Denver and in, in Colorado who got together and said, we are gonna change the state, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna bring in marriage equality, we are gonna transform. And they, it wasn't a whole heck of a lot of money that totally remade politics in, in those states in completely opposite directions. So, you know, um, if you're dealing with somebody, at, at some point, maybe you can go to your donors and say, 
you know, uh, for what you're paying me, I need to worry about deductibility, but aren't, aren't you bigger than that now? Um, and then just eliminate all this and they can, they can help change the world themselves because other people are. Now, it doesn't always work. Um, you know, the, the Jeff Bush campaign can be happy. <laughs> but uh, it certainly, uh, it has worked in a number of states in both directions. So, summing up. Internal Revenue Code, IRC is under abbreviation, I forgot to explain. Uh, public charities can lobby within those limits, no substantial part for the 501H election. Lobbying is legitimate. It's encouraged, it's even protected. They can't take your they can't take the First Amendment away from you. And private foundations, while they can't do any lobbying themselves, have a lot of ways to impact public policy and public attitudes as long as they do. So, any questions? Those are some good websites. I think everybody always asks Lori for the slides, so we'll get these. Um, independent Sector or Boulder Advocacy are the two places to look. They have specific sheets out for what private foundations can, can do. Um, be but I've got 10 minutes for questions before the book comes. You mentioned that uh, private foundations can fund research and analysis and then can be invited to provide an opinion. Um, there, there was some a bullet In response to a written request by a legislator. So that, that might answer the question. If we were asked to testify in front of the committee, you know, something like that, is that, is that allowable? Um, if it's in presenting response, that analysis, if you are, we need a you written would, I, I would want to be invited in writing okay. and have, have somebody on the committee saying, we would like to call you as a witness to testify on this. I would still want to make sure that my presentation was nonpartisan analysis. I wouldn't go down there and be an advocate for specific legislation representing a private foundation. Right. As an individual, you can go down and testify, or whatever, but and you don't have to be invited. As a private foundation, you should be invited specifically in writing as a witness to do that. And that would be the same. That there you're just presenting it orally as opposed to giving them a, a response. Um, this would be your third question. So who else? <laughs> yes. This is about the general operating support issue. So suppose you want to give general operating support to an organization, but 80%, let's say 8% of their budget goes to lobbying. Isn't your general support still essentially getting tapped back? Do you have to consider that well, kind of percentage of their budget? Um, well, first of all, 80% probably won't, doesn't qualify it's under, you know, that, that's, if you're, first of all, you're only giving, you're a private foundation. If you're giving to a PC, you're not going to get 80% because that's, you know, the qualitative test that's way too high. And under the 501 age election, that, that nobody gets that high. You get maybe the 25% or something like that, but that's about it. But if the private, if the PC is good, they're not spending more than 5% or they're within their 501 age election, you can give them general operating support as long as it's their decision. Yes. You know, do we know that if we give a particular public charity, they're going to engage in public activities? Yes, but it's not tracked back as long as it's general operating support. You're not designating for it. You're not responding to a budget that has it as a line item. Uh, and it's their decision whether to spend it. They could, they could fire their lobby. They get your check. They could fire their lobbyist tomorrow and spend it all on salaries. You know, and you have, no, and you have nothing to say about that, then it doesn't matter. I'll do one more. Come back to my friend. Yeah, we're good. Um, supporting organizations are public, are private charities, public charities. Um, supporting organizations can be public charities uh, if they qualify under one of the various tests for supporting organizations. Um, the question would be whether it makes more sense for the supporting organization to do this because it is there for a specific purpose to support the organization or for the supported organization to, to make to, to, to make it. The problem with a supporting organization, I'm, you know, I, I like to work into this a little bit. This is just a off the top I had answer and I don't take this one to the bank, but I'm worried that if you're a support one, one a couple of the different types of supporting organizations, that if you went off and did lobbying within the supporting organization, that might violate the terms of your support for the parent because you're
you're off doing other things in the public sphere as opposed to having having your aims go straight up. So it might be better to do it in the parent, the supported organization rather than the supporting. But I think there are types of supporting organizations who could do this. And also a supporting organization could fund the things that aren't blocked, the nonpartisan research could respond to direct requests. And if that's a that's an easier way for you to do it or more accessible than that. Back to you. So the broad dissemination, if, if there's a private foundation, you want it, the research to be done and you want the word to get out, better to partner with somebody to have them do the research and then get the word out because they're going to put it on their website, it's broad dissemination. Right. Uh, private foundations really shouldn't be in the business of doing that. Uh, the, the IRS wants um, that kind of uh, work with the public to be done in the public, out of the public charity. So in that case, as a private foundation, you could convene the public at large to discuss an issue, or you could convene certain selected thought leaders that happen to be a lot of different public charities to say, we need to discuss this, and all of us are going to pull on our particular wars. Some wars will do different things than others. We need to get the public. I'm leaving four minutes on the table. Okay, thank you very much.